This is dry tulip poplar bark right here. You got a nest? Okay. That's a bird nest that's made from tulip, that's made from this bark right here. That whole thing is made from this. And all that is is just processing it down in your hands like this to make it fine hairs. That whole thing that he's passing around right there is made of nothing but this bark. Okay, and there's a million tulip poppers out here. Easy way to tell a tulip poplar, you guys are going to learn, I'm going to repeat this stuff a lot of times, but the easiest way to tell a tulip poplar out here is look for the tallest tree you can find that's almost straight, that doesn't have any branches for the first 15 or 20 feet because they've all fallen off dead. Um, I can tell you right now, that tree right back there is a tulip poplar. It's not the tallest tree, but I can tell by looking at the bark and the way it's growing as a tulip poplar. That's the only one I see right here in this immediate spot, but there's a bunch of them back in there and there's a ton of them back here behind us. Um, but they grow long and straight like that and really tall. They get to be 135 feet. They're the tallest tree in the eastern woodlands. They generally lose their branches on the bottom so that they can achieve photosynthesis with their higher branches. They grow above the rest of the canopy so that they can grow. They're also the fastest growing tree in eastern woodlands. They'll grow 12 feet in the first year. A one-year-old tulip pop will be 12 feet tall. Um, but they are the best tree in the eastern woodlands as far as resources go for a lot of things. Number one, for bird nest material like we're doing right now with this. Number two, for cordage. Okay, they'll make strong enough cordage to make a bowstring out of if you use it wet, if it's dry and, or if it's a wet tulip pop. You can harvest the bark and make containers and quivers out of the green bark. So it's a very, very good resource to understand. It's also the best wood out there for making a feather stick out of because it's really soft. It's the best wood in the eastern woodlands other than probably cottonwood or red cedar to use to make a bow drill fire with. You can use the whole the whole tree split open to make a bow drill fire. Now, this stuff right here, once you get this shredded down, and this is something I just pulled out of this pile of stuff that we collected. It's not that good fine bird nest, okay? But once you get this stuff down, it should be, you should be able to ignite something like this. And the key to this whole thing is these fine fibers and surface areas. The more fine fibers you can get exposed, and the thinner those fibers are, the, highly, the more highly combustible they're going to be. So you really want to get those fine fibers exposed. And then when you make your bird nest, you want it nice and random with lots of that stuff sticking up. So that when you set fire to it, when you hit it with your ferro rod, it lights right up. Okay, that's what you want. Okay, so let's talk about the ferro rod for a minute real quick so I don't lose track of what I'm talking about. When you use your ferro rod, it's very similar to the way I showed you guys to make feather sticks with your knife. You want that ferro rod somewhere, you know, I mean, you want your knife somewhere solid. You don't want to be doing this. Okay, I see a million people doing that. You want this thing buried, and you want your tender source right there, and you want to pull up into your tender, just like that. That's what you want. I can set the grass on fire. That's, yeah. okay? <laughs> That's what you want. Emergency tender sources. Mini Inferno. The reason we created this Mini Inferno was everything is soaking wet. I can't get anything to light. I've got wet tulip poplar bark I'm trying to deal with like this, and I can't find anything else. But if I can get this to burn, I can get a bird nest of this on fire. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm just going to, and this is completely waterproof, I'm just going to break it open just like this, expose some of those fine fibers, and Mini Inferno has accelerant in it, okay, and there's a difference between accelerants and fuels, although engineers already know this stuff, okay. Fuels require open flame to burn. Vaseline is a fuel, so everybody says cotton balls and Vaseline, cotton balls and Vaseline. That's not the best fire starter. Vaseline is a, is a fuel. Kerosene is an accelerant. Something that will combust by fume is an accelerant. Something that has to have open flame to combust is a fuel. This, is, this has got an accelerant in it. So all I have to do is hit it with sparks and it's going to burn. Whether it's wet or whether it's dry, I can pull this right out of the creek, bust it open because it's a highly combustible cotton pad impregnated with an accelerant and then dipped in wax. So it's completely sealed. So when you open that thing up, you're going to smell the accelerant. That will burn for six to seven minutes. That gives me plenty of time to dry stuff like this out and get it to burn.
So if I've got a bird nest of marginal material, I can get that bird nest to burn by already having that sure flame sitting there, okay? But it still has betula in it. You can still smell the volatile oils in this. But the key to this stuff, to any, any material, is what? Processing. Processing, okay? So I've got to take this and I've got to shred this stuff up to expose the most surface area I can get and find fibers that I can get. Once I do that, then I can pile that stuff up on itself, get in there with my ferro rod, and get after it. Okay? You see that black smoke coming off of that? that that's the oil. That's the betula in that birch bark burning. Okay? Highly combustible. So what I would do with something like this is I would use this for my fire lay and I would lay this right here and I'd put something highly combustible like a bark of some kind on top of that and this is a shredded strangler vine bark. And I'd take some of that strangler bark and I would do what with it? Process it, okay? And I'd process that down as fine a hairs as I could get because the finer those hairs are the higher they're combustible they're going to be. And the higher, higher the combustibility level is, the faster I'm going to be able to get this on fire. And then I'm going to take this and I'm going to do this. All right, and this is what I'm going to use to start my fire. Once I've got my fire lay, this is going in my fire lay. But I'm going to turn this over on itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this on fire. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to turn it completely over on itself because heat does what? Right. 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 And that is going to go in my fire lay. All right? If your stuff starts to go out on you, spread it out. See how I'm all I got to do is lift that up and it immediately gets back on fire again? Exactly. I'm letting oxygen flow in there. Okay? Let's talk about plants for a minute. <coughs> Milkweed pods. Like this. All right? This fluffy stuff that's inside these milkweed pods has a volatile oil in it that will catch flame very quickly. But it's considered a flash tinder because it burns up as fast as it goes up. So you got to combine this with something else. So if you can take these pods like this and combine them with some kind of a bark, that might be a little bit damp. And you can tell when stuff's damp, if you put something against your face and it feels cold, it's wet. If it feels warm, it's dry. So anytime you pick up something you're thinking about using it for tinder, put it up against your face. Is that dry or is it wet? And again, what am I going to do with this? Process it, okay? I ain't giving nothing up. If I don't process it and it takes me 48 strikes of the ferro rod to get it right, whose fault is it? How much energy did I waste for what? For nothing, right? The trick is completely in the processing. Everything that I do has to do with the processing. Again, don't be afraid to pick that stuff up. You give it some oxygen. Okay. Okay. 
So we're going to talk about right. fat wood. But let's talk about a fire lay first, okay? If I'm going to make a fire lay, and I'm using material that I've collected, this right here is a barely enough to get me started. <clears throat> Three times this would be what I consider okay. For the purposes of this course, when we say you need to make a sustainable fire, that means you need sticks on fire the size of my thumb. That's what I consider sustainable. I can walk away from that, go get more, bring it back, and it's not going to be out when I come back. Anything smaller than that may go out before I come back. So stuff like this is marginal as far as a fuel. Now, when I collect my stuff, I want to segregate this stuff in piles. I want kindling, I want tinder, and I want fuel. My tinder source is going to be this kind of stuff right here or my processed bird nest, which is where is that processed bird nest over there, okay? That's going to be my tinder source or a twig bundle could be my <coughs> tinder source or this birch bark could be my tinder source or fatwood could be my tinder source. And then I need something that's highly combustible to go along with that, like a bird nest, some kindling, and then I want to go to the fuel. Kindling is going to be wood <coughs> that is pencil size or smaller, okay? This stuff right here is what I would consider kindling. Anything bigger than this is too big. So really what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate this stuff out in piles. And I don't have to be that meticulous about it, but I'm going to be pretty close. I'm going to try to separate the smaller stuff from the bigger stuff because I want the small stuff readily accessible to me. You see these pieces of wood right here that almost look like antler? That's tulip poplar. Every bit of that right there is tulip poplar. Softest wood in the eastern woodlands. Okay? Crack. Hear that? That's what we want. This stuff right here is going to make the best feather sticks on the planet. Because it's real soft wood. See those shavings? So if you're looking for something to make feather sticks out of, and you don't want to have the hard way out like we gave you with the oak, this is the stuff you're wanting, okay? Any shavings that come off of that thing, I'm saving them, all right? But if I'm making a feather stick, that's what I'm going to make it out of. That's going to be my first choice, all right? So I'm separating my pile still. And really, all of this stuff is kindling. There's really no fuel in this pile. It takes something a little bit bigger than this to be considered fuel, but not much. Like I said, I want sticks on fire the size of my thumb. If I can get stuff on fire this size right here, it's probably not going to go anywhere anytime soon on me. Okay, so what I'm going to do if i got to build a fire is first of all, if the ground's fairly dry, I'm not going to worry about getting my fire up off the ground. If the ground's wet, I'm going to build a base down here of just, you know, sticks the size of my thumb, boom, 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 on the ground and build my fire on top of that because that's going to keep me, number one, I'm not going to suffer from conduction. I'm not going to have the ground sucking the heat out of my fire. Number two, I'm not going to suffer from the moisture into the wood coming up from the ground it gets heated up and getting my wood even damper than it already is so all of those things are even if the ground's damp you really want to put a base down there what i'm going to do in this case is i'm just going to take some of this birch bark and i'm just going to lay it down here on the ground that we have left and some of this tinder that's like marginal that i probably wouldn't use and i'm going to lay it down there okay then the next thing i'm going to do and it depends on what type of fire you're building if i'm building a fire where I process the wood because I couldn't find anything dry like you guys did with the oak. I'm going to build a log cabin style fire with that. Boom, 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 boom. I'm going to build a pyramid log cabin and I'm going to put my tender bundle in the middle of that if I can. Okay? And strike into it if I can. If I can't, I'll build a triangle and build that triangle up and then I'll put my tender bundle where I can push it in there when I need to. I would take this and push it in when I was done. Okay? Then I'm going to take my smallest sticks, and the other mistake that people make a lot that I see is they get too worried about perfection with this stuff. This stuff don't have to be perfect by any means. I'm going to build myself a little bit of a wall over here to begin with. I might even take this wet bark 
and put it off to, one, off to the back side here so it'll dry out as I go. That ain't gonna hurt nothing. It'll just dry out that way and burn later. Then I'm gonna take this stuff and I'm just gonna build myself a bit of a teepee with it. Don't worry about perfection, like I said. Just stand it up there. Then take your other stuff and build around it. What I like to do is just leave myself a small opening because I'm gonna pull this over the top when I'm done. Like I said, too many people worry about this thing being perfect and it don't need to be. But you need lots of air space. It needs to be able to breathe. So when you pull it over the top, you don't want to smash it down. I see that mistake happen a lot too. People pull their fire down over the top of their stuff and they just smash it. And they take all the oxygen away from their fire and then it ain't never gonna stay lit. Like I said, I ain't getting perfect here. I'm not worried about that, okay? Now, I know that if I hit this with a ferro rod, it's gonna start. No question, we already know that, right? So let's not do that for a minute. Let's look at pine for a minute. We're gonna show you guys how to collect fat wood. And it doesn't take a whole lot of this, so it's a resource. And what do we do with our resources? Conserve. We conserve them, right. Exactly. Okay. What you're gonna wanna do with this stuff is, guys, with pine fat wood, Use the back of your knife to process any wood that you have to process that you're not actually cutting. If you've got bark, a piece of tulip poplar bark, like this, let's just use this one for example. I can take my knife and scrape the back of this. See what's happening right there? See all those fine fibers I just exposed and how quick I did that? Okay. That's highly combustible. If that was dry bark, that's money, okay? You're gonna do the same thing with a piece of fat wood. You're gonna take the back of your knife and you're gonna scrape it down. I saw some leverage here. And you're gonna scrape that down like this. And you're gonna want, when you're doing this, you want about a dime sized pile of these shavings. To a quarter. So just do this on a flat surface somewhere where you can kind of scrape them up into a little pile like this. And if I did things right, 
I shouldn't be having to sit there and blow on it and mess around. It should go. Now, fire. Triangle of fire. Oxygen, heat, fuel. Any of them three things are missing, fire's dead. All right? We're giving it oxygen from underneath. We're taking advantage, okay, of the updraft because we've got an airspace here. So we got updraft coming in here with oxygen, forcing the heat up through my fire bundle. All right? I won't add any fuel to this fire, period, until the flames are above the current level of fuel. If I start putting wood on here when the flames are still down low, it's going out. I'm going to starve it of oxygen. So you've got to wait till the flames are above the current level of fuel before you add more fuel to the fire. That's very important to remember because people get in a hurry and they're like, oh, oh, I need to get more sticks on there, you get more sticks on there. And then the fire goes out because they didn't pay attention and wait until the thing was really ready to put more fuel on. The more small sticks you have, and that's the, other, that's the other big thing that I see people do in these classes is, what they'll do is they'll come back with their fire lay, or what their fire preparations are, and they'll have sticks the size of my wrist. And that's what they're going to start their fire with. Them sticks got to be pencil size or smaller, what we call smalls. And you'll hear, you'll hear that term out of Chris Wick's mouth all day long. Smalls, more smalls, more smalls. The smaller sticks you have, the higher combustible they're going to be because the flames can get around more surface area faster and they can heat that small lumber up quick and make it highly combustible where you're not going to be able to do that with bigger sticks. That's what I would call a sustainable fire. Strike it, get away from it. Pull it over the top and you're done. No huffing, puffing, blowing, messing around. Done. Okay? That thing's ready to add all the fuel I want to add to it now. Okay? So what's going to happen now is